start recording. Yesterday I was uh, in a different class and I thought I was recording. It wasn't, it was not recording. So I lost one lecture that way. Um, so we are recording right now and I just need to move the correct window over and then we can get started. Today is a Tuesday, Thursday. So we're going to get to the Tuesday, Thursday class. All right, excellent. So we're here. Um, let me double check on the recorder, just to be sure, because I don't want to repeat the ex repeat the experience from yesterday. So we are recording. Audio is good. Video is good. So we can now start with uh, the continuing on the topic. So last time we did talk about the double precision floating point number format, and then what we'll do today is to start the discussion of how to convert from base 10 scientific notation to base 2 scientific notation. That's going to be the focus of today's lecture. So what we'll do is we are going back to the notes first because I want to show you guys where we are and hopefully you are up to speed in terms of your reading because you know that is crucial to the understanding of the material in this class. So we are now in uh, floating point number representation, and we are now going to do the conversion from base 10 scientific notation to double, which is the binary scientific notation. All right, so the first thing is um, we are going to take a look at the format of a base 10 scientific notation. Um, I'm not sure how many of you had the time to read this entire section. This is how we describe the syntax of a base 10 scientific notation that makes use of a Manton set. All right, um, it's called a regular expression, and you probably would say, but this is anything but regular, right? You know, look at all the backslashes and all the, you know, the funky looking you know, punctuation. So what we'll do is we'll, we'll first take a look at this description, and then we're gonna uh, take a look at how to how to convert from base 10 scientific notation to base 2 scientific notation. All right. <clears throat> Do we have any questions before we kind of dive into the uh, the regular expression description of the syntax of a base 10 scientific notation? Yes, that, that was a mouthful. Any questions? All right. So the first thing that you might have on your mind but you're not asking is why do we need to understand regular expression? It is not a topic in assembly language programming nor computer architecture. Well, it's a very handy tool to describe you know, a particular syntax. Um, how many people have some experience with the concept of a regular expression? Okay, so what do you if you don't mind, you know, what do you use regular expressions for? Okay, and the regular expression is used to expression to match patterns. There are two ways to match patterns. One is to make sure something is syntactically correct. Okay, that's one way to use make use of regular expression. The other one is to look for certain things within a certain string. Okay, so you can use regular expression to say, I'm looking for something that looks like this. Okay, and then your know, regular expression, you know, um, I should say you know, a lot of search um, a lot of search ability of editors can use regular expressions to look for certain things that meets a certain you know, requirement. So that's what it's for. In this case, we're going to explain. I'm going to explain this. You know, I really hope everybody had a chance to read this first because it really helps that you read this first. So the first part is it, everything in square brackets or just brackets <coughs> specify alternatives for a single character. 
So in this case, you know, the single character can be a plus or a minus because these two characters are enclosed by square brackets. Okay, and this becomes one particular entity, and it is followed by a quantifier. This quantifier backslash equal to basically says whatever is immediately preceding can have zero or one occurrence, which means you can have up to one of whatever is before. So in this case, we can have up to one plus or minus symbol, but we can have none as well. Okay, backslash equal to means zero or one occurrence. And then it is followed by, okay, oops, okay, that was not my intention. Get back here. So then it is followed by, you know, once again, we have brackets, but this time we have a range of characters in between. So now we have one to nine in between, which means the next character has to be a one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine as a digit. One single one of those. And then it is now followed by a group. <clears throat> which starts with a backslash you know, open paren and it ends with a backslash close paren. So the backslash open and backslash end parentheses, they encircle a group. This is inside a group here, so we'll now explain what is inside a group. Backslash dot specifies that this has to be a single period as a punctuation. Okay. Now the reason why a dot has to be backslashed is because you know, backslash is also known as the escape character in the context of Linux and many other programming contexts. So the reason why the period has to be escaped is because otherwise it means match any character. It's a wild card to, to match any character. And then we it is followed by backslash D. Backslash D is a shorthand of something that looks like this, except it starts from zero. So backslash D means any base 10 digit from 0 to 9, okay? <clears throat> and then we have an asterisk after the backslash D. So the asterisk is also a quantifier, kind of like the backslash equal to, except in this case, it says whatever is immediately, immediately preceding the quantifier can occur in any time, including 0. So we can have 0, 1, 2, 3, you know, you know, and so on of occurrences, in this case, of the 0 to 9 digit. <clears throat> so when you combine this entire thing, everything from here all the way to here, simply says, you know, you can have, you must, you know, in order for this group to be syntactically correct, you must have a single period as a punctuation followed by any number of 0 to 9 digits. Okay. And then we have the, the entire group specified here. But this entire group is followed by a quantifier again. The quantifier is once again a backslash equal to, which means zero or one occurrences of the previous item. So that means you know, the decimal point followed by a bunch of digits of the mantisa is optional. You can just say three, okay? It is syntactically correct. You can say 3.14, it is syntactically correct. You can say three point with no digits after the point, it is still syntactically correct. So are we kind of doing okay with this? Okay, all right. Um, and then we there's another group following this. So once again, this is a group, okay, because we have backslash open paren, we have backslash close paren, which describes a group. But this time, I'm just going to say the entire group is also optional. You can look at backslash equal to as optional. Whatever is immediately preceding, preceding the backslash equal to is optional. So this time, what is in the optional group? What is in the optional group is a sequence. It has to start with a lowercase e. Then it has an optional sign, which is plus or minus. Then it is followed by, you know, mandatorily, it's followed by um, digits. So this time we have another quantifier, which we haven't seen before. It is a backslash plus. Backslash plus is slightly different from the asterisk. The asterisk says any number of whatever is preceding, backslash plus says at least one of whatever is preceding. So we need at least one digit after the E, you know, when we specify the exponent of a scientific notation. So that's kind of like a quick description of regular expression in a nutshell in, you know, surprisingly about five minutes. Do we have any questions? Yes. Um, are we only expecting? 
No. Okay. Okay. So, so there there are two answers to that question. One is because the exams are always open book and open notes, so there's no expectation of memorization, right? Just by default. The second thing is I will not ask questions about this in your exam. Okay. So why are we wasting time? Why are we wasting oxygen to talk about this? Because this will come, this will become useful to many of you later on in life. So I'm just you know, giving you an earlier exposure, so that you know at least what is a regular expression, what it looks like, what it can do, uh, so that later on, you know, when you get into regular expression, because you have to use regular regular expression to check the syntax of zip code, phone number, social security num number, and so on, you know at least what it is and what it is capable of. All right, so if this describes, okay, the syntax of a base 10 scientific notation, the first thing we need to do in order to do a conversion between the base 10 scientific notation to base two scientific notation is to have an, uh, a parser. You know, basically a parser is a fancy name for a piece of logic to separate the different parts of something, a string typically, so that we can extract you know, the different coordinates. Okay. Um, based on your prerequisite you know, satisfaction, which is CISP 360, you should be able to write your own C subroutine to parse a base 10 scientific notation and say that, oh, this is the digit before the dot of the mantissa, this is the dot, this is the fractional part of the mantissa, this is the E separating the mantissa from the exponent, and this is the actual exponent. Okay? How many people feel that, yeah, I can do that, I feel like you know, taking on that challenge? <laughs> I, I think I, I'm not quite sure exactly what you were saying that the program is going to thing we need to do. Okay, so what the program needs to do is the following. Let me uh, <clears throat> get the tablet going first, and then we'll talk about it. This is not really the main focus of this class, but it is kind of important to talk about because there are not really a whole lot of other classes that talk about this. The next time you, you see concepts like this is likely to be what people would call a data science class, okay? Because in data science, you need to validate the input, you need to separate your things from the input into chunk, little chunks, and regular expressions are very, very useful for that purpose. So, you know, that's a little bit separate, you know, story from, you know, what we need to deal with in this class, but that's okay. So well, what I'll do is let me let me start up the um, um, oh okay I got the um, mouse cursor on the wrong screen. Oops, there we go. That starts up the. Um, the tablet mirror software. So this way I can show you what I want to show here. Okay, so to answer your question, you know, I need to separate the parts out of a string. So you'll be given a string like 1.23e negative, say 45. And let's say we have another, another negative here. So I need to parse and say which part is the mantissa, which part is the exponent. Now the problem is, you know, this is not the only format, the only valid format of a you know, base 10 scientific notation. It can be as simple as this. It can be this. It can be this, right? It can be just three point. It can be three point E negative two. It can be four E six and so on. So all of these are valid. Um, expressions of a base 10 scientific notation. The question is, can you write a subroutine you know, to parse this so that we can break out the mantissa or the coefficient part from the exponent part using only your code, like not calling any other subroutine to do this parsing. So using your CISP 360 experience, you should be able to do it. 
Okay, you might need a little bit of time. Okay, this by itself may be a one or two week project for some people, but you should be able to do it. You don't have to do it because I got this code already written for you. Is that okay? All right. <clears throat> So now we go back to the notes, okay, because I just want to talk about the syntax first. Now we go back to the notes and basically say, what are we going to do from here on? So it's all in section 5, conversion from base 10 scientific notation to double, which is a base 2 scientific notation, more or less. So what we're dealing with here is we are trying to preserve the value being represented. The value being, re being represented uh, can be expressed like this. Okay, this is the sign bit. The sign bit can be a, a zero or a one. If it is a one, we choose negative one. If it is a zero, we choose one as a multiplier. This multi if this is multiplied by the coefficient in base 10, and then it is multiplied by an exponent of base 10, and eventually we want to convert this to everything in base two. So we want to convert this to have exactly the same sign multiplied by a coefficient in base 2 times 2 to the power of an exponent in base 2. That is what we want to do. We want to preserve the value as much as we can, except, you know, to start with, we have a base 10 coefficient, a base 10 um, exponent, and we want it to end up with a base 2 coefficient as well as a base 2 exponent. Does everybody sort of understand what we're trying to do here? Maybe. Okay, I can give you an example. Just let me. Uh, I need to get rid of my long sleeve because it's getting warm in here. Okay. All right. So I'll give you an example. Um, I have to use an example that is doable because there are some numbers to that that cannot be converted. So we'll start with 1.235e, um, let's see, yeah, we can do this. This is an easy one. So 1.25e2, oh, it's, what? Sorry? Yeah. Oh, on the ground, thank you. Just in case, just in case I step on it, thank you. So now we look at this number and go like, okay, so this is a base 10 scientific notation, which is 1.23 times 10 to the power of 2. And eventually we want to convert this into a base 2 scientific notation. So let's repeat that exercise that we have done already previously and see how we can convert this into a base 2 scientific notation. So as a base 2 scientific notation, we know this is a 64 plus a 32. Um, I think there's a 16 as well. Yeah, there's a 16. Um, that may be, that's an 8. There's also a 4, okay? Um, so that means you know, this is 1, 1. Okay, we know there are two zeros here, and then we have five ones. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, like that. Which is then 1.1111. 1. 1, 1, 1, 1. Uh, in base 2 times 2 to the power of what? I'll let you guys decide, okay? Because you know, if you're just listening to me you know, talk, talking about this, um, things are not going to sink in. So I want you to help me de determine what, do, what should I, what is the exponent of 2 in this case so that I end up with the same value? Do you guys remember from last Thursday's lecture, you know, every time we move the decimal point or binary point to the left, what do we do with the power of 2? We increase it by 1. So how many times do we need to move the implicit binary point to the left? The implicit binary point was here. Uh, so we'll get a plus 1 at the end. A plus 1 at the end. Right. Okay. Very good. So we'll put the one here. Thank you. Yeah, you're correct. Okay. So we have. Um, there we go. 
But the question is, you know, once again, you know, how many, what is the exponent of two? What should I put here? We just have to count the number of times we have to move the binary point. So how many times are we moving it? Six times, okay. Uh, six times is correct. So that means you know, we have, oops, yep, there we go. All right, so this is what we want to do, okay? We want to figure out the logic to do this. We start with a base 10 scientific notation. We end up with a base two scientific notation. You look at this example, you go like, oh, that's pretty easy. You know, I cannot imagine how, why this can be difficult. Well, I can give you certain values that makes this almost impossible to do by hand. I can just say, what is 1.3 without any, I mean, if you want to, you can say it that, like that, okay? How does that translate to a base two scientific notation? As it turns out, 1.3 is not something that can be represented with a fixed number of bits. So it's gonna have a recurring pattern which means you know, this is gonna be a little ugly if you were to do it by hand. So we want to be able to do it using a computer, you know, using a program, using logic, and that's what, we, that's what we are going to focus on. Are we doing okay so far with the discussion up to this point? Okay, all right. All right, so the other thing we also want to focus on is no floating point calculations. In other words, we are not going to use log, we're not going to use power, we are not going to use you know, uh, floating point number division or multiplication. In fact, the entire program should only be used, it should only be using integers. 64-bit integers, sure, not exactly 32, but we'll, use, we'll be using 64-bit integers. Why do you think I place this restriction on this particular program. <clears throat> well, let me show you a picture. Okay, so we'll switch to the browser again, and we'll take a look at the you know, FPU die size, okay? And look at some images. Looks like a reasonable picture. All right, so all right, so you can see that there are you know something you know, called um, FPU, and FPU is called a floating point unit. So every time you use a double, every time you use a float, it has to utilize you know, that portion of a CPU. So the, the FPU, FPU. So each core has one FPU, and then the other you know, FPU is down here. So FPU is not something that is present for all devices. For instance, if you have a you know, track health tracking device like a Fitbit or a you know, Apple Watch or something like that, it is probably not going to have an FPU because an FPU takes up ex extra die size you know, if it's on the silicon, and it also increases power consumption. So if you want your Fitbit to last five or six days, okay, you probably don't want to have that extra circuitry unless it is absolutely necessary. Are we doing okay so far? Do you understand your why FPU is a great thing when you do not have a power consumption restriction, but when you're dealing with you know, devices that really need to have a longer battery life, you do not want to have the FPU unless you really need it. Is that concept okay? All right. So what about you know, processors that are without an FPU? Well, as it turns out, your processors that are without an MPU can still perform you know, floating point number calculations. In other words, you can have two double multiply divided. You can have sine, you can have cosine, you can have tangent, you can have log, you can also have X, you know, power except it takes a lot longer to do the calculation. So that means, you know, if you want to reduce the power consumption and maintain the efficiency so that programs run fast, you want to limit yourself to only using integer arithmetic. So that's why I'm going to place this restriction here, no floating point calculations. 
So without using floating point calculations, without using floating points at all, how do we perform this calculation? Okay, that becomes the next question. All right, so does everybody understand the restriction, the constraints, and why we are having these constraints in some of the applications? Not all applications, just in some applications. So now we move on to talk about you know, how we can actually do this. The first problem that we have is if the input looks like this, we immediately have a problem with the mantissa itself. Because in this case, the mantissa itself is 1.23. So if I were to separate the uh, scientific notation into the mantissa and also the exponent, it would seem to me that we have to have a floating point number representation. But that is not the case, because we can do tricks to remove the, to remove the necessity to use a floating point number representation. Okay, because this number is also 123 E, so how do I adjust the exponent in order to represent the same value? Yep. Subtract it by two, very good, because if I multiply the coefficient by 100, I need to somewhere you know, div you know, divide by 100. So another way to divide by 100 is to multiply by 10 to the power of negative 2, which also means you know, the power of 10 just has to decrease by 2. <clears throat> then we have exactly the same value. Very good. Okay? So I'm glad your, your, your math is you know, helping you because this is all math. Okay? So that means you know, no matter what kind of coefficient you give me, I can always represent the coefficient as a integer, and I just have to adjust the exponent accordingly, then we can do with just integers. Does that part make sense? Okay, all right. So now we have that problem solved, and now we are basically you know, talking about the value that we are representing. It's always going to have um, a few components. The first one is you know, something that we have talked about already, which is you're looking at the sine bit. If it is a one, we multiply by negative one. If it is a you know, zero, we multiply by a one. This is the ternary expression. You know, this is the, the boring part. And then we, always going, we are go going to have a coefficient in base two times two to the power of some kind of exponent, which is only for the base two representation. And on top of that, we are also going to have you know, some sort of, hmm, I messed up here. So that's okay, you can, still, you can still kind of keep it the way it is. So I'm just gonna say this, and this is kind of like a mixed coefficient. So the coefficient is not specific to base two, it is just a coefficient, but then we have E2 and E10, one is the power of base two, the other one is a power of base 10, so we have to kind of play with C, E2, and E10 in order to maintain D as the same value. Are we sort of doing okay here? Yep. Sure. So this basically means if S equals to, uh, okay, I shouldn't say equal to, it's just if S return negative one, else return one. That's kind of, it's kind of like a micro conditional statement, but contained within an expression. All right. So that's not really the interesting part, okay? Because the sign maintains you know, exactly the same way, whether it is in base 10 or base two. The question is, how do we adjust the coefficient so that we eventually remove E10. We want E10 to become zero, but we also want E2 to be adjusted so that D is maintained, the value being represented is maintained. All right, so are we understanding what we need to do? Okay, so I can give you a number, you know, with a, you know, something just like, you know, the example here. 1.23 times 10 to the power of 45. I want to eliminate the 45, which is initially the E10, or after the conversion is actually 43, which is our E10. We want that to become zero. 
but we want to make adjustments to the coefficient, which was initially 123, and also initially a e2, which is in, which was initially a zero, so that whatever the coefficient is times two to the power e2 would still be maintaining the value that we want to represent, which is 1.23 times 10 to the power of 45. Is the objective of what we want to do understood? Because you know that's the first step of you know understanding what is what is to come. Because you know, unless you know what we are about to do, the other steps would not make connections. It would not. It would not make sense at all. So are we are we good so far? Any questions? No questions. All right. Well, then we're gonna go into some of the details. Okay. Um. All right, so we'll uh, switch to the uh, the module again. So we talked about how to get rid of the decimal point already by adjusting the exponent of 10. We can always get rid of the decimal point of the mantissa. The mantissa is no longer the mantissa, by the way, because you know 123 is not less than 10. So it cannot be called a mantissa, it can only be called a coefficient. That is based on the definition of what the mantissa is. A mantissa is a coefficient that is, we talked about this on last Thursday. Sorry? Greater than or equal to one and less than the base, very good. So if we're dealing with base 10, 123 definitely is not a mantissa, but it can still serve as a coefficient. All right. So now the focus is to get rid of the exponent of 10. There are two cases. One is to deal with the exponent of 10 was originally negative, and then the other one is to deal with the case when the coefficient is originally greater than zero. So these are two separate cases. We'll deal with one at a time. But before we go there, okay, we, have, we also have to kind of figure out a few things. Okay? So we'll go through you know, this entire module over here. The value, you know, without consideration of the sign, is always going to be expressed by some kind of a coefficient times 2 to the power of whatever the exponent of 2 is times 10 to the power of whatever the uh, exponent of 10 is. So there are always these three components you know, used to specify the value that we want to represent. Is that okay? We are just making adjustments, okay? We are just you know, playing with C e2 and e10 so that eventually we want e10 to be a zero and then we want c to use up you know as many bits as we have provided so we have the highest possible precision and then e2 is really only here so that eventually you know the entire thing the entire product still boil down to the same value that we started off with is that okay we Doing okay so far? What the objective is? Yes? Maybe? Okay, we, I, I got a few nods. So we are going to move on. All right, so consider an integer division n divided by d because it's an integer division. The quotient is only the integer part of the actual result of the division. Which is you know which has a truncation error. Okay, so we'll focus on this part first. <clears throat> and if you multiply you know, uh, n, so let's consider the case where n is d times q. D is dividend. Uh, let me, no, let's stand corrected. So d is the divisor, q is the quotient, r is the remainder, and n is basically our dividend. Okay, hold on a second here. What did what did I just say? There were four terms that I just introduced, but do you remember how those four terms relate to each other? Let me repeat those four terms. Dividend, divisor, quotient, and remainder. How do those terms relate in the division? Okay, so I'll give you the answer. In a division, whatever you put inside here is the dividend, 
Okay, this is called the dividend. The thing being divided. This is the divisor. The divisor is what you use to divide the dividend. Whatever you have up here is the quotient. And then when I was a kid, I was taught to use a R and then you specify the remainder. Okay, so are those terms understood now? I mean, we're, we're clear on the terms. Okay, all right. So once we are clear on those terms, in this case, N is the dividend. This is the divisor, D is the divisor, Q is our quotient, and R is our remainder. This is the relationship between those four terms. The relationship between the four those terms, those four terms is the dividend equals to the divisor times the quotient plus the remainder. Is that okay so far? Because you know, this is uh, this is arithmetic. It's just that you may not have you know, encountered these particular terms for a while. But when they were talking about when when they were teaching you division the first time, you know, I'm pretty sure these terms were introduced. Okay? All right, so now what do we do? So we basically say n divided by d is going to be the same thing as dq plus r, the whole thing divided by d, because n is dq plus r, and it becomes you know, just q plus r divided by d. When the fractional part is truncated, the ratio of the error is r divided by n. In other words, this part here cannot be represented in a normal integer division because um, it's called an in integer division because the result is an integer. It is not representing the actual value of the entire division. Okay, so when you're looking at all these symbols and you go like, oh, this is way too abstract, you know, it's not easy to understand, what do you do? It's a strategy that you can use in all of your classes because this is not going to be the only class that will introduce abstract concepts. When you move on to a four-year university, every single class is gonna look like this. So what do you do when you look at some abstract definition? You go like, I'm not really quite getting it. Then what do you do? Make an example. Make an example. Use concrete values, okay? So let's use some concrete values. So we are going to, I'm just you know, picking you know, a, you know, pick some random some number out of thin air. So I'm going to make my n equal to 117. I'll make my divisor, I don't know, let's pick something fun, like an odd number, another odd number. 17 is an odd number. Yeah, we can use 17. Okay. So now the question is, what is our quotient and what is our remainder? Well, you do the division, right? So we have 117 divided by 17. Uh, there's nothing here. This has to be a zero. So now you have to actually divide 117 by 17. Uh, six. Six is not going to work. So five is probably the last one we can do. This is the thing about base 10 you know, division is you really have to master multiplication first because otherwise you cannot do something like this, right? Because how do you determine it's a five and not a six? Because you have to be able to do the mental math of six times 17 is already more than 117. Does that make sense to you? Okay. Of course, you know, many people these days would just go like, uh, I'm just gonna go get my calculator out and do the calculation. I don't need to do all this mental math in my head. I still insist that I do that. Okay, you know, I don't insist that you have to do it, but I still insist that I, you know, to, I, I, I would do that, just because you know, I mean, this is one way to keep your mind sharp. Okay, so we multiply this. Okay, we we have a five here with a carry of three, and then five one, and we get eighty five. I think. Yep. That doesn't look right. Should not be a five. But if I have a six. Then we have, oh, okay, that's, that's me being foggy. A six would do seven, seven would not do. So a six would do, okay, sorry, I, I take it back. Because in my mind, you know, I thought six times seven is 63. No, no, that, that was nine times seven. So 
So 6 times 7 is 42, and then we have 102 over here. So we, when you subtract 102 from 117, you get 15 left. There we go. So I do apologize for my arithmetic mistake, you know, because I insisted not using a calculator. So in this case, <laughs> 117 is our dividend, 17 is our divisor, 6 is our quotient, and then 15 is our remainder. Are we good so far? So the other way to look at this is to say 117 divided by 17 is 6 and 15 17. Does that make sense to you? This is the same thing that I was trying to explain using the variables, you know, uh, N, D, Q, and R, except this time we have actual numerical values. It makes everything easy to understand because now you can relate. How did we get this? Oh, it's a division. How did we get that one? It's the remainder. How did we get that one? It's a quotient. Are we doing okay so far with this? We good? Okay. So now the question is, what about this? I mean, you know, we can do all this you know, arithmetic stuff, but what is the big deal of this? Well, the big deal is, what if I declare x is unsigned? Um, okay, then we did not use x. We'll go ahead and use the same terms, okay? And is uh, 117, and then we'll declare um, unsigned again. Um, this is our dividend being 17, okay? And this time I am going to use uh, a single result, okay? So I cannot use R, we'll just say X. So unsigned X, and then we say X is N divided by D, like that. So what do you think X is gonna end up with? What is the value of X when we perform a integer division of N divided by D in this case? In other words, we really just divided 117 by 17. So what do you think is going to be in variable x in this case? Hmm? Six. Six, exactly. So, huh, okay. So x is not really the entire result because it's only doing, it's only storing this part here. The other part, where is it? Where is the 15, 17 you're going? It's lost, okay? So we have an error, okay? In other words, if you look at x as the result of n divided by d, we have an error, okay? So now we want to analyze you know, what is the quantity of the error. In other words, we want to look at you know, r divided by d, okay, which is the error, as opposed to what the quotient is supposed to be. So the ratio of the error is r divided by n, um, you know, basically, uh, n is our dividend, and this much is lost in the division. And we want to keep this as low as possible. In other words, we don't want to lose the precision you know, in the division. So the question is, how do we do that? Okay, so let's you know, go to a new slide and we'll kind of check out you know, how we can not lose you know, as much you know, uh, precision you know, by, in the division. Are we still doing okay so far with the math stuff? Okay, all right. So now we look at um, 17 divided by 10. And it, as an integer division, so that is 1 and 7 tenths, right? But once we truncate it, okay, so once we uh, basically take the floor of, you know, this number here, it is just 1. So what is the error in this case? What is the percent error in this case? Well, what we should have is 1.7, but the error is 0.7. So this is our error rate. Does that make sense? This, the correct answer is 1.7, but the actual answer that we're getting is one because it's an integer division. So the error in this case is 0.7 divided by 1.7. Does that make sense? Okay. Which is not really acceptable because this is a huge, it's almost 
of error. Okay, so we don't really like this. So now let's take a look at some other alternatives. Okay, so what if we are to multiply 17 divided by 10 by 8 divided by 8? Okay, are you guys buying that this is really the same thing as 17 divided by 10? Because 8 divided by 8 is 1, okay? So it would appear that I'm not doing anything useful here. Well, but we can, I can explain why we are doing this. So first of all, we multiply 17 by 8, which is uh, 8 plus 56, which is 156. 36, sorry. 136 on the top, divided by 10. So that takes up you know, the multiplication by 8 over here. So we can multiply this whole thing by 1 8. So unless my arithmetic is wrong again, I think this is correct. Okay, so I'm just going to double check my math here. 7 times 8 is 56, and uh, 8 plus 5 is 13. So I think 136 is correct. So are we doing okay so far with this math here? Yes? Okay, so we focus on you know, the error of the 136 divided by 10. So when you look at 136 divided by 10, it is 13 and 6 divided by 10, right? And since we can only store the 13, so the error, percent error in this case, is the uh, 6 divided by 10, which cannot be represented, divided by you know, what the answer is supposed to be, which is 13.6. So it's 0. 0.6 divided by 13.6. Don't you think this error is a little better than last time, which is 0. 0.7 divided by 1.7? Okay. So we are now comparing the error rate, you know, of this one versus this one here. Much better. Why is it 13.6? Hmm? Why is it 13.6? Because it is 13 and 610. So which is 13.6. I mean, you can you can just look at this at 13.6. There you go. Okay, so that means if, if, if I multiply this whole thing by 128 divided by 128, the error, the error uh, percentage is going to be even lower. Yep. So how do you get the error rate to the number of people? I think it, yeah, that's what I wrote, but I think it's supposed to be uh, it should be the, uh, the actual result of the division. Yeah, my note is wrong. The number of results. Yeah. Because it's the, uh, it's the difference between the correct answer and the incorrect answer divided by the correct answer. That's the error. Yeah. Yep. Okay, but this is much better, right? So that means you know, if I can do something like this, okay, 17 divided by 10, this time I multi multiply by 128 divided by 128, the error rate is going to be even better. But then we have a problem. What is the problem? The problem is, um, Tak, you, know, you are doing great with this part here, but what about this part here? What do we do with what do we do with the 18? Because we have to keep track of. Oh, by the way, okay. Do not just look at 136 divided by 10 as an integer result. We have to remember that we have to divide that by one by eight. Okay, divide the whole thing by eight. So what do we do about the eight here? There's a reason why I chose eight and one twenty-eight. They are all powers of two. Very good. So that means, oh, okay. Well, that means you know, instead of looking at this as one eight, we'll just say hmm, that. In other words, we can adjust e2, which is the power of 2, to absorb the constant that we have to multiply to the original integer before the division. So this is how we can minimize the error rate, you know, the percent error, when we perform a division. So I'm going to pause here and see if this, is, this part is OK. <laughs> No, maybe. What do you do with the two to the negative third? Like, what do you do with it? 
the so that means you know in this specific case this means you know, e2 just need to be negative 3 because remember how we want to represent the value the value itself is represented by some kind of a coefficient times some power of 2 times some power of 10 so I am free to modify what e2 is so by adjusting by doing the math the way that I did over here I just have to remember oh by the way do not just look at the result of the division you have to remember that we have a power of 2 the power of 2 is supposed to be negative 3 here is that Well, it is part of how we represent the value. So in this case, okay, so in this case, if we need to store what is 17 divided by 10, okay, let me start a new page here. So we got two options. 17 divided by 10 can be seen as just one times two to the power of zero, okay? But this is, this is bad because we have lots of error, lots of error in this case. Is that okay? So the second method is to say, well, why don't we multiply this whole thing by 8 divided by 8? Then what do we get? Well, I cannot remember, so I'm flipping back here. So we get 13 in this case. So we have 13, but we also have this. Is that okay? So the coefficient has changed. This is the coefficient. This column here is the coefficient. And then this one has e2 being 0. This one has e2 being negative 3. I'm trying to preserve the value as, as much as possible. Is that OK? Yeah. So by doing this, I have a higher precision, which means I have a lower percentage of error. That's kind of you know, what we're trying to do. We, are still, we still need to divide by 10. The question is, what is the percent error when we perform the division by 10? Are we still doing OK so far with this? That was a good question, but are there any other questions? Yep. So you just uh, convert the coefficients regularly and have this be positive as well? Um, yes. So we are adjusting the coefficient and also e2 at the same time so that we can minimize the percent error. So if I were to push this one more time, okay, I can push this one more time, okay, and this time we choose 128. So now, you know, this time I probably have to use a calculator. So let me switch the, the calculator here, and I have a Command line calculator. Of course, everything is command line. <laughs> this whole thing divided by 10 is 217. Um, okay, so switch back here. This is 217 times 2 to the power of negative 7. So in this case, E2 is negative 7, but my coefficient is 217. But you can probably imagine this one has even less percent error because we are looking at um, okay let me switch back to here so the actual answer should be let me see if it has mod so let's go mod 10 oh it does have mod okay so the actual error is 0. 0.6 so when you look at 0. 0.6 divided by okay the actual error is 0. 0.6 divided by 217.6 so you can see how this is going to be a much smaller number compared to the previous one. Is that okay? Can we see you know, how playing with this math game here can help us minimize the error after a division by 10, and we can basically keep going, right? Keep increasing the power of 2 from 128. We can move up to 1,024, 2,000... 48, and so on and so forth. The question is, how far do we want to push this? So the, quest, the answer is, we want to multiply this by some power of 2, okay? So some 
uh, I'll call this M N. I'm just trying to find a letter to describe this. Let's say Y, okay? So how, what, how do we determine this Y? In other words, at a certain point, okay, it doesn't make sense to bump it up any further. So the limitation is we want 17 times 2 to the power of Y to barely fit in an A 64-bit unsigned. That's how we want to do it. Is that okay? Because mo most modern processors can handle 64-bit integer arithmetic in one single clock cycle. So that means, you know, hey, if you're doing 32-bit calculation, it's using one clock cycle. If you're doing 64-bit calculation, it's also using one clock cycle. But if you want, if you want to do 128-bit calculation, it's going to use two clock cycles. So that's why you know, it makes sense to maximize the width of the operation to 64-bit calculation. Because using one single clock, you get the most done with most modern architectures. Does that make sense? Okay. So later on, we'll figure out you know, how to determine this Y. Because some of you are looking at this and go like, oh, I know how to do this. Okay, because what we need to do is to set up an inequality like this. This has to be less than or equal to 2 to the power of 64 minus 1, and we're just solving for y as an integer, right? That's a pretty easy thing to do, because what you do is you, um, you basically change this inequality to become you know, 2 to the power of 64 minus 1 minus 17, and then we use log, okay, to figure out what y is supposed to be. Easy peasy. Well, easy peasy if you can use log. <laughs> Remember what I said earlier. No double precision or floating point calculations. You cannot use log. So the question is, if you cannot use log, then how do we determine this y? So we'll, we'll talk about this later. All right, so this is one aspect, OK? The other aspect has to do with rounding, OK? The problem with this kind of calculation, okay, let me go back to the previous slide here, to this one here. So even though with this technique, we can change the percent error from 0.7 divided by 1.7 to you know, 0.6 divided by 13.6 to 0.6 divided by 217.6 and so on. We can reduce the quantity, but it's always gonna err on one side only. In other words, when you look at the integer, okay, so let me present this in a slightly different way. So in other words, if you look at um, x divided by y, doesn't matter what x is, you know, or what y is, minus x divided by y, but floored, this is always going to be greater than or equal to zero. Does that make sense? Assuming x and y are both positive. Does that make sense to you? So every time we perform a division, there's going to be some rounding errors, or th in this case, uh, there's some error because of the integer division. But that error is always going to be positive in this case. Or you can say that it's always negative because the result is always going to be less than what it is supposed to be. So that means if you do repeated calculations like this, the error is going to accumulate, but only in one direction. So you have a biased error in this case. So this is called a biased error, which is not good. We have to deal with errors simply because you know, there's no way to represent things exactly as they are. So we have to deal with errors. That's an inevitable part of conversion. But we don't want our error to be always in one direction because if the error is in, in, in one single direction, it will accumulate. And when they, when they accumulate, then your actual end result is going to be pretty far away from what, what it is supposed to be. So we don't like biased error. So instead, instead of taking the floor or just using the uh, truncation, we want to use rounding. Okay. So now we'll, we'll take, a look at, take a look at rounding. So when you look at the rounding of 0.5, what is the rounding of 0.5? It's 1. The round of 0.3 is a 0, and so on. 
Does everybody understand grounding in this case? So anything that's greater than or equal to 0.5, round up. Anything less than 0.5, round down. Is that okay? Is that like, oh, okay, that's kind of cool because you know, we can just do the rounding and then the error is gonna, it's not gonna be biased anymore, okay? Because half the time it's gonna round up to the next value, half the time it's gonna round down to the previous exactly. value. So that means you know, the, bias, the, the error is not gonna bias anymore. The only problem with this approach is round is a floating point number calculation. And we don't want to do floating point stuff. So the question is, how do we do rounding but without calling the subroutine called round? So we're going to do a few observations here, okay? Every time we do rounding, it is because we have a division by 10, okay? So this is a given. So, so that means, you know, we are looking at the rounding of some number divided by 10. Okay, is that okay so far? All right. So I'm going to claim, okay, without any proof, I'm going to claim that this really is the same thing as um, x plus 5, the whole thing divided by 10, but instead of rounding, this time I'm just truncating. Truncating is easy because that's just your math division. That's just integer division. Okay, that's my claim. So when I make a claim like this, what do you do? What do you want me to do? Prove it or demonstrate it, right? You know, okay, so we'll go ahead and demonstrate it and we'll use a few examples, okay? So the first one is x equals to 117, okay? So then we look at the rounding of 117 divided by 10, which is the round of what? Um, 11.7, which is 12. Is that okay? Is everybody convinced that if you round the result of 117 divided by 10, not using integer division, the result should be 12? Yes? Because 12 is the integer that is closer to 11.7 than 11. Does that make sense? So now we try the other way, okay? So now we try the other method, which is 117 plus five, the whole thing divided by 10, but then we take the floor of that. So that becomes the floor of 122 divided by 10, which is the floor of 12.2, which is also 12. Is that okay? Okay, well, it looks like you know, rounding up works in this case, but we'll try to look at something that has to round down. So we'll put it here. So let's look at the rounding of mm, 103 divided by 10. That is the round of 10.3. And since 0.3 is less than 0.5, we are rounding down to just a 10. So now we take a look at the other approach, which is taking the floor of 103 plus 5, the whole thing, divided by 10. That becomes one, the floor of 108 divided by 10, which is the floor of 10.8, uh, which is also 10. Is that okay? So this is a magical method, because even though there is a floor function, and the floor function is a float function, I don't need the floor function because all I need to do is to use integer division. In other words, as long as I'm doing integer, integer division, the floor is automatic. Does that make sense? So that means, oh, so we can just do everything using integer operators and we achieve what we need without the use of rounding. You just have to add one half of the denominator before you do the division. Are we good so far? Yes, I hope so, okay? So the next question is, why do we need to bother with all of this stuff here? And why do we keep mentioning division by 10? Okay, let's take a look at the next slide, okay? 
remember this thing here? C is our coefficient. We, we can choose what E2 is, but we start with a E10 that is not zero. Right? This is the value that we want to represent. Are we good so far? So we are going to start with the case when E10 is positive. Okay? So we'll say assume E10 is greater than zero and it is an integer. Okay? So the question is uh, how do we get rid of E10? Actually, I take it back. <laughs> Minor change. This has to be negative, not positive. Erase, erase. There we go. All right. Let me double check. It is negative. It's negative. Nope, it's positive. Sorry, sorry. If it is positive, then we switching back to this. <laughs> okay, this this is okay. This is this one is correct. Okay, so what if we start with something like this? Um, I will give you an example, okay? What if we have you know, 123 times 2 to the power of initially 0 times 10 to the power of negative 2 to begin with? So how do we get rid of the negative 2 in this case? Well, you, have, you can bump it up, right? Okay, so let's try to bump it up. So now we say, okay, we'll figure out something here. And we multiply it by 10 to the power of negative 1. Okay. And to do this, what else, what do we need to do? We still have a division by 10 somewhere, don't we? Because by changing the exponent of 10 from negative 2 to negative 1, we are hiding a division by 10 somewhere. So where do we do that division by 10? with the coefficient, okay? So now we have to say, hmm, okay. So can I write this as 123 divided by 10 times you know, 2 to the power of y divided by 2 to the power of y, and then the whole thing times 10 to the power of negative 1. Would that work? Just using your algebra, y is some kind of, you know, some kind of integer. Does that make sense? Okay. Am I still getting B back by doing this? Well, let's check it out, okay? Use your math. Division by 10 times 10 to the power of negative 1, so we, end, we go back to 10 to the power of negative 2, right? Because division by 10 is 10 to the power of negative 1. So when you multiply 10 to the power of negative 1, and 10 to the power of negative 1, you get back your 10 divided by 10 to the power of negative 2. Is that okay? Uh, 2 to the power of y divided by 2 to the power of y doesn't seem to make anything, right? Because that's just 1. So 123 is still here. So are we, are we doing okay so far with this math here? Yes? I hope so. So now what do we do? We go like, oh, okay, but we can group things in a slightly different way. So now we can say, it's approximately, okay? I lose a little bit of precision, but not a whole lot. So I can now group 123 times 2 to the power of y, the whole thing divided by 10, plus 5, okay? This is doing the rounding. So that means I still have to account for the 2 to the power of y as a, as a uh, denominator. So I can take care of that by saying, oh, okay, it's just 2 to the power of negative y. And then we multiply the whole thing by 10 to the power of negative 1. Are we buying this? This is algebra. Yep. Yeah. 
The addition by ten is the same thing as multiplication by ten to the power of one. So just to just to make sure that that is clear, one divided by ten is the same thing as ten to the power of negative one. Okay. So are we are we finding these equations? Skipping this one in the middle, are we finding that 123 times 2 to the power of 0 times 10 to the power of negative 2 really boils down to the same thing as some kind of y here. We want to maximize y as much as we can. So, but do you think this is about right? Because this is the core, okay? This is the core of how we do the conversion. Okay, so if you're not buying this, okay, I can try to convince you, okay? So the way I'm trying to convince you is to group things together so that, you know, things that cancel out, you know, would cancel out. Um, I'm not sure what is the best way to do it, so I am going to, I'm going to give this a try, okay? I'll use the highlighter to give it a try. These two combined is what? 10 to the power of negative 1, okay? Negative 2, sorry. So these two combined is being that. Are we good? Okay. Change to a slightly different color. We're going to do the light blue color here. This combined with this just cancels out. Because here one is 2 to the power of y, the other one is 2 to the power of negative y. The product of these two cancels out, becomes 1. Are we good? And then we have the 123 left behind, but that's the easy one. Okay? Because 123 is really the same thing as the original 123. So is that working out okay with you guys? Okay. Now, are we going to lose something? The answer is yes. We're going to lose a little bit of precision. Okay, because you know, whenever we have an integer division, we're going to lose something. But we have to remember the numerator of this division here is, is something that is close to 2 to the power of 64 minus 1. How big of a number is that? How many decimal digits are we talking about? Let's think about that a little bit. Okay, looking at the time here. So let's think about you know, the number of digits for, uh, okay, use the mouse pointer. If you look at just this portion here, how many base 10 digits are we talking about? It has to get close to 2 to the power of 64 minus 1. So what I'm really asking is, if you look at 2 to the power of 64 minus 1, in terms of base 10 digits, how many digits are we talking about? Okay, do you guys remember the trick that I have introduced? Um, 1,000 is approximately 2 to the power of 10. Do you guys remember that one, or did I mention that in this class? I thought I did, okay? So 2 to the power of 64 has 6 of those, right? So we are looking at 6 times 3, which is 18 digits already. Are we good? But that only takes care of 2 to the power of 60. We still have 2 to the to the power of 4, which is 16. So that means this quantity that we are looking at here is going to take up 19 digits in base 10. Are we good? So you're, you're looking at a huge number, okay, that has 19 digits in base 10. You divide it by 10, you lose a little bit of the precision. Are we losing a lot of precision? Nope. It's negligible, okay? It's just that it, you're still losing something. It's just not a whole lot. All right. So we are definitely running out of time. So I'm going to take roll. I still want to take rows in today's class. <laughs> what, are, what are we? I mean, are we in elementary school? Why are we taking row? All right. So I have to make a new one here because I did not get it prepared. it in here and we'll make it go after lab floating point one so 
Okay. And then meanwhile, we're going to take a look at floating point two, which is what you are going you will be doing today in the lab. So we'll, you know, I'm going to release this one first, and then we'll get back to the rotating one. All right. So eleven fifty AM. All right. And the access code is EXP for exponent for this one. So save and publish. We'll go back to the row taking one. Because it takes time for the row for the copying function to work. All right, so now we are looking at <coughs> row taking. Today. Okay. It's the wrong date, you know, I'm gonna have to change it. Today is ten oh three. And then we'll have to change ten oh three here. Or I'll make it ten thirty. That gives you plenty of time to do it. Alright, and the access code is Round. There we go. All right. So the row taking activity should be available now, and then the access code of the row taking activity is round, but the lab is exp for exponents. Okay, so give it a try. If it doesn't work, let me know. I'll write it in here. So EXP for the lab, and then we have round and row. All right. Any questions? Okay. Not see any questions. The recorder is still on, so I definitely got today recorded, so there we go.